Benvingudas. Benvinguts. Welcome all back to Fixing the Future, to explore the future of education together with us from Atlas of the Future and some of the most uh, in brilliant minds in this field. How can we prepare our children for this rapidly changing future? Which are the main challenges of the current educational system? And which are its opportunities? These seven sessions will try to answer these and uh, other questions. Your questions. So don't be shy and remember to uh, do not miss the opportunity to ask anything to our expert by using the chat box. Remember also that we are live streaming in uh, two channels, one in Catalan, one in English. But let's start now because uh, Eduard Vallori, who you already met uh, last week moderating Stefania Giannini's session, has many, many uh, ideas to share with us. As you probably know, uh, Eduard is uh, president of UNESCO CAT and uh, um, founder and, and uh, director of uh, Escola Nova 21. His session uh, will be moderated by Anna Guitart, uh, scriptwriter and journalist specializing in literature and books, as well as a um, regular contributor at uh, Catalonia Radio. Welcome, Anna. Uh, thanks for your warm welcoming. And first of all, I would like to, to apologize. Uh, we are running a little bit late. This was caused to technical problems, so please excuse us. We will still have one hour uh, to talk uh, with Edouard, so don't worry about that. Uh, get ready, ask all the questions that, that you want to have. It's not every day that we can have someone, Silvia just said, a brilliant mind uh, here, so it will, it will be great to, 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 talk, to talk to him. I will be asking uh, Edouard your questions. Um, I would like to introduce him a little bit, not much, because I suppose that if you're here, that's because you already know him. I think I could just say that he's someone com committed to education, to a certain education, and that's, that's, that's what he will tell us, that, what he will explain. Um, Eduard is a social analyst, a World Scout expert. Silvia just said it, he's the president of UNESCO CAT and founder and creator of Ascola Nova Bintiu, which Eduard defines as an alliance for advanced education system. I'm quoting him when he explains that over three years, it has catalyzed the efforts of thousands of teachers and hundreds of schools and institutes to move the whole education system in Catalonia to make it possible for everyone to get a quality education. There is something that really impresses me, and this is that it involves half a thousand schools and institutes in 60 local networks, more than 50,000 teachers and 220,000 families, and a representative sample of 30 centers with which, together with the schools, they have developed an intensive transformation procedure, which now everyone can use. Eduard is involved uh, in a lot of initiatives, and I find that all of them have in common that they work for a better world, and I think education is one way to, to reach it. So, Eduard, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for being here, and I can't wait to listen to you, so all yours. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you to you all to be here. Um, I took this, uh, this uh, quote from the Catalan poet Miquel Martí Pol in his poem Right Now that says, talks about how the world and life are problematic and uh, then it says, it is worth knowing it, but it is also worth thinking about a bright and achievable future. Com bé saber-ho i com bé d'altra banda, pensar el futur lluminós i possible. This bright and achievable future uh, could be something we create through education. But I wanted to show you how 120 years ago, people were thinking on how the future of education should be. Uh, maybe we could see uh, the, an image of that time. Yeah, this is Jean-Marc Coté. Uh, this is a, a series of little, of little um, 
images uh, on how the world would be uh, in the year 2000, that's 1899. And this is the result of the debate of whether uh, education is like kindling a flame or filling a vessel. Because if it's filling a vessel, the idea is that maybe technology in 100 years, like in 2000, would be so advanced that all the contents of books could be transmitted directly to the minds of the kids. If you take uh, um, this nice piece of Charles Dickens uh, of the middle 19th century, Hard Times, it starts precisely with this entrepreneur saying, now what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. This idea that facts, that the, the contents of the books is the only thing that should go uh, to the minds of the kids is in the, in the core of the debate of education. So let's go and see um, in the 21st century which are the facts. So we start knowing that we are having the first generation where connectivity is permanent. We don't know anymore what it is uh, like to be um, uh, to be bored, to, to don't know what's going on around you. And the generations that are now in schools live in this world of permanent connection. We are also the first generation in history that has proper knowledge that our actions are destroying the planet, are creating uh, the climate uh, world, and uh, not only the world, the climate crisis. And the consequences that this has are natural disasters, uh, massive migrations, poverty, wars, uh, refugees, and like the scandal that we are having in the area of Greece and uh, Turkey. Um, we are having cultural clashes, like the one that we lived a couple of years ago, for instance, in France, uh, in the same place where the bikini was a debate uh, 70 years ago. Now the debate is on the burkini, uh, on whether uh, Muslim women are too covered. Uh, we have the big increase of poverty and inequality. Uh, poverty is being reduced worldwide, but is increasing in our streets um, and inequalities are growing uh, all over the world. Uh, the tensions, the movements against uh, immigration, uh, the discrimination for race, um, the, um, the permanent action, violence, physical or psychical or institutional against women. But at the same time, we have uh, people like uh, Greta Thunberg or like Malala that are being a reference on how young people could be the answer of the reality that we are living in. But education is not only about all of this. It's also about how we could transform things that we give for granted. For instance, in science, uh, this, uh, this scientific uh, magazine uh, three years ago, it was published a research showing that gender stereotypes about intellectual ability emerge early and influence children's interests. It means that before they are five years old, boys and girls don't give importance on whether a bright person should be a boy or a girl. But after they are six, they believe, more than 80% of them, that a bright person is mostly a boy. And that creates predisposition on learning and on leadership and on many actions. Uh, when talking about reality, we are also talking about digital transformation, how internet has transformed, how people access to information and knowledge, how they interact, or the direction of public management and business. And this is related with the disruptive technology, um, not only mobile internet, the 4G, and we are now facing um, the 5G and even the 6G, uh, the internet of things, advanced robotics, advanced materials like the graphene, uh, net generation genomics, 3D printing, but also how the big data and the exponential growing of computational capacity 
are creating something uh, so fascinating like the artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the impact that all of this has on automatization of uh, jobs, transformation of productivity, and transformation also on politics. We know that this idea of post-truth, the fake news, we are having a nice example right now in the States, the growing of populism, uh, this increase of xenophobia, racism, and fundamentalism is, um, is, in, is, um, uh, is increased by uh, those new technologies because it makes uh, information available in such a huge amount that it's very difficult to know what is true and what is not. If we go to 1972, when UNESCO uh, published the first report on education called Learning to Be, the Edgar Faure report, we could see this quote that says, look, because technology is transforming in such a speed, 1972, we should no longer assiduously acquire knowledge once and for all, but learn how to build up a continually evolving body of knowledge all through life. Well, 50 years have passed by since then, and we are still in a situation where education systems had been designed by this uh, transmission of facts, uh, these uh, facts that, um, that the character of Charles Dickens was talking about. And in uh, 2015, in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, UNESCO published a document called Rethinking Education that says that we should consider education as a common good. Common good means that if the, if the person that I'm close to is not receiving good education, it, it affects negatively to myself. So common good means something that if someone doesn't have it, it affects the collectivity. And this idea of education as a common good is linked to a double element. One, we should redefine what quality education is today. And to understand that education is much more than this transmission of facts that, um, that the Dickens character was saying in 1854. It is a complex learning to live in the world of today and to answer the local and global challenges of today and tomorrow. This is quality education. And the other element is what equity is. And equitable education means to make that quality education available to everybody. The ancient declaration that developed the SDG4, which is the one on education, it says that this is a historical commitment by all of us to transform lives through a new vision for education with bold and innovative actions to reach the ambitious goal by 2030. Which ambitious goal? Not only to transform education for kids to be better prepared for the job market, but to equip people to answer the global challenges. Now, what is the problem here? that the same UNESCO in the document Education for the Sustainable Development Goals explained that to equip people to answer the SDGs, we need a holistic and transformational education, which requires a shift from teaching to learning, an action-oriented transformative pedagogy which supports self-directed learning, participation and collaboration, problem orientation, inter- and transdisciplinarity, and the linking on formal and non-formal learning. And this puts us uh, for the complexity to understand what competencies mean today. Let me show you this with a couple of slides. Maybe we could put the first one now. I hope the, the slide could be entered. Yep. So you could see that uh, in English, there is a confusion between the terms skills and competencies. And the document Rethinking Education precisely explains, look, 
competencies refer to the ability to use knowledge understood as information, understanding, skills, values, and attitudes in specific contexts and to meet demands. For instance, if you think on how you learn a language, you memorize information, meaning vocabulary, you do an understanding of complex com concepts, like for instance, uh, verbs, you develop skills like pronunciation, and you acquire values and attitudes, like, uh, for instance, uh, being able um, uh, to, um, to be resilient or to be um, consistent or uh, um, knowing when you are in a failure, in a situation of failure, being able um, to overcome it. But if you acquire this knowledge in a separate way, you are not competent to uh, speak and understand a language. And the articulation of all these elements are the ones that make um, uh, the competence uh, to develop. But also, it means that we should learn in a different way. We cannot learn these elements separately. And that's asking for a different way to understand what a curriculum in the education system should be. And here we have a second, um, a second slide that could uh, explain this. This is a slide uh, of the framework of future competencies of the International Bureau of Education published, uh, of UNESCO published in 2017. And you could see that this interaction that was showing of these different elements um, that uh, create a competence uh, lead to seven macro competencies that all curriculums in all countries should have. Lifelong learning, self-agency, interactively using diverse tools and resources, interacting with others, interacting in and with the world, transdisciplinarity, and multiliteralness. The interesting thing of this um, um, of this uh, document, of this framework of the International Bureau of Education, is that it shows the public good that these macro competencies create. It says awareness, adaptability, agility to adapt, innovation, empowerment, social justice, productivity, sustainability, efficiency, justice, democracy, democracy good governance, social cohesion, equity and inclusion, citizenship, domain specialists, human resources, human capital, functional literacy, digital societies, health, and well-being. Well, why is this relevant? Because what the International Bureau of Education, of Education is saying is that we need these macro competences to be properly in all curriculums. And actually, in the last 10 years, many countries have been developing new curriculums, following this competency-based approach. Now, we should realize that there is a big gap between the discourse and the practices. In many societies, we are talking about competencies, but we are still linked to disciplinary subjects. We are talking about the competency-based curriculums, but we are still based on what the school textbook says that uh, in chapter number uh, 10, in page 30, um, the school textbook says on a particular issue. And therefore, we are talking about active and autonomous learners, but we are actually still having in schools and in universities, mostly actions for passive learners, listeners or readers. And you could imagine this when you see how most curriculums are talking about a conception of learning that sees the, the pupils as active actors, how the learning takes place in interaction with interaction of other pupils, the teacher and other adults, various communities and various learning environments. But then you go to a school, mostly in secondary education in all uh, Western countries, and you see rows of desks and the kids listening to the teacher, all of them looking at the board. 
So, how could we imagine this bright and achievable future? Well, first of all, seeing that an answer to that already existed. Uh, in the early 20th century, we had incredible experiences like the Montessori schools, the work of John Dewey, uh, De Croly, uh, Frenet, many approaches of schools, project-based learning, um, uh, um, a scientific approach based on uh, schools that were going outdoors. All of this that was happening then, today, the, the scientific knowledge on how people learn is saying that was the right path to take. And actually, today you could see in many places of the world experiences that go in that direction. Uh, next week, uh, Kidan is going to explain the experience of Riverside in India. Uh, you have uh, the experience of High Tech High uh, or Bride Works in the United States. Um, in uh, my environment, in the Catalonia, we have uh, lots of schools that are working in this way. And probably you in your town or in uh, your area know schools where learning happens by doing and by reflecting by this doing, and by linking the, the, acquire, the acquisition of knowledge on the relevance and the meaning uh, of, this, uh, of this acquisition. When we talk about this, suddenly we have the pandemic coming. And with the COVID-19, it's important to understand that we are not far from this. We are in the same place. And actually, uh, last August, um, United Nations, the Secretary General of the United Nations, presented the policy brief called Education During COVID-19 and Beyond. And this brief says, we must take bold steps now to create inclusive, resilient, quality education systems fit for the future. And it makes a call for action in four key areas. The first, reopening schools, we, we should guarantee for every creep that learning is not being discontinued. Second, we should prioritize education in financing decisions, meaning that all budgets of education of all governments must not only not diminish, but increase, because it's an investment for the future. Third, we should be targeting the hardest to reach, we should target inequalities in education. But four, to create this inclusive, resilient quality education system for the future, we should take a leap towards forward looking systems that deliver quality education for all. And that means investment in digital literacy and infrastructure, evolution towards learning how to learn, rejuvenation of, long life, uh, of lifelong learning, and strengthened links between formal and non-formal education. And we need to draw on flexible delivery methods, digital technologies, and modernized curricula in this competency-based uh, way, while ensuring sustained support for teachers and communities, so to empower education systems through empowering teacher training, teacher selection, teacher and development, and the equipment of schools to make this future education possible. Because the future of education that we had been talking about since 2000, which is not that image that we had at the beginning, that image that in 1899 we're thinking on how education should be, we forget that one fifth of the 21st century already passed. The future of education is here and is now. And if we believe in education as the gateway for this bright and achievable, and achievable future, yeah. we must start right now to build the future of education in each one of our towns, in each one of our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eduard. I have so many questions <laughs> and I suppose there are people also who have questions. I'm going to start, but please uh, 
send everything uh, you want to know today that we have the chance to be talking to to Adwar. Um, Adwar, uh, I was paying attention and I think that there is a word that you used a few times and I thought that's important. We're talking about a transformation. We're not improving. It's a transformation really in education. Is that right? Exactly. And this is fundamental. The idea of transforming is what uh, uh, Stefania Giannini that we had here last week talks about, the paradigm shift. It means changing the paradigm. It's not to improve what we already had, but to create something new. Not the education to reproduce what we had, but to equip people for a world that is evolving in such a speed that the lineality of change or progressive improvement is not enough. We need to create an education system that is able to give answers to this world that is in an exponential change. Mm -hmm. you, you said, uh, you finished saying, the future of education is here. And I thought uh, about uh, teachers that I know that, that I thought would be afraid <laughs> listening to that because I think there are people who feel that they don't know how it's going to be, if they are fit to do that, if they will be able to do that. Uh, so I think there, re there are people who are worried about that. Of course. And I think that one of the biggest mistakes in the debate on uh, transforming education is to think that all the weight goes to the teachers. No, the weight goes to society. It's society that decides how teachers are trained, how teachers are selected, and how teachers' professional development should be. So if we ask for a paradigm shift, we should equip the whole education system for this shift. You were mentioning before the Escola Nova Vintiu uh, initiative mm -hmm. that we promoted here in Catalonia yeah. in the last three years, between 16 and 19. And precisely it was an initiative that tried to do this, to experience with teachers how working together with them, equipping them for change, could help schools to be able to answer to this. But this is a system need. It's not something, it's not the responsibility of the individual teacher. So teachers that are, afraid, that are afraid are right to be afraid. But it's society that is having the problem if our education systems are not answering this. That's why support and empowerment of teachers is fundamental. And that is why budgets for education should not only be maintained, but increased. And do you think uh, you talked about education during the pandemic? And uh, I don't know, maybe I think that was uh, a crisis that we, we, we realized in case we didn't know that uh, some things weren't working that well. Uh, do you think that the fact that we could all see that, maybe people who never thought about uh, the need there is of a change in education, do you think that the fact that we all saw that, that the teachers are so exhausted, that there were so many people, children, uh, who, who couldn't participate from, from, from lessons, for example, because they weren't uh, digitally equipped, do you think that this crisis will give us a chance to say, okay, we really need to improve, we really need to do things differently? Well, hopefully, but we have two different levels here. One level okay. is what we have already experienced in our professional life. All of us have seen that in this pandemic, our professional life has been transformed. Whether we could do something online or not, or uh, whether our work is related with something that had been totally interrupt interrupted, like uh, traveling or like uh, um, all the services that there is in our society. So education somehow is linked to this very problem. It's exactly the same. But then there is another level. We have realized that our education systems were under equipped because we believed that they didn't need 
what now they were needing. So for instance, we have schools here in Barcelona that didn't have proper high quality internet connection for all kids. So then suddenly you realize that when you want to do something related with the internet, they were not properly trained to work with this. When I say they, I mean the whole educational community, teachers and mm -hmm. kids. But we also have a methodological problem. We, we had been so focused on this gap between uh, what we say and what it happens, this idea that we talk about competencies and we are still linked to, um, to disciplinary subjects, that then when you move towards the distance, instead of being able to transform reality as the ground for learning and learn maths and sciences and, um, and critical thinking and, uh, and um, a social organization through what is going on now with the COVID-19 or what is going now in the elections in the state, we were still focused on chapter number 10 of the textbook and on, the, on page 24. And then suddenly you see that that makes no sense when you are in a Zoom meeting with uh, 20 or 25 teenagers, right? So we have realized that somehow we were not having the relevant and meaningful learning that we should have for our kids. And as I said, this is not a problem of the teachers, it's a problem of society. So we have the two levels, the problem that we had as a society, all professionals, and the problem, as you said, that we have realized that the, ed the education systems in most Western world, but I would say in the whole world, were not prepared for the society we are living in. Mm -hmm. Eduardo, I'm going to start uh, with questions from the viewers. Uh, so, Kaira Seinstil, sorry Kaira if I didn't pronounce it well. So she says, we are talking about developing competencies and knowledge, but what about the child? How education can give opportunities to a child to recognize the tremendous potentiality within him? Education should talk about uh, not transformation of the medium or the content, but the transformation of the child, isn't it? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, actually, um, the, the competencies as a learning goal is the way to, con um, to, um, to land the concept of the whole development of the child. So if the goal of education is systems, like it was stated in 1972 in the Edgar Ford report, is the whole development of the child, the integral development of the child, it means that disciplines and languages are um, contributions to this whole development. But instead of this, the education system, and in the universities even more evident, had been transformed to um, to a um, superposition of those disciplines and languages. So instead of the whole development of the child, you have the child that learns maths, the child that learns literature, the child that learns uh, history, and the child that is learning a particular language. And then the sum of the grades of each one of these elements is the result. Well, we have to go back. And this approach, the one that I showed, uh, I shown of, uh, of the International Bureau of Education, the idea of these seven macro competencies goes in that direction. It says we have to understand what this whole development of the child means. And then you go to all these big dimensions, which it means that the concretion of what you learn, particularly in May, in history, is not that relevant anymore because the relevant thing is whether at the end of your process you have developed all competencies that develop that help you to develop and there is another element on, on this question our education systems have been designed uh, based on a logic of selection 
So the one that is good goes to the university. The one that is bad goes out. And this is why in my society, we are leaving the early school abandonment, early school leaving in Europe. It means that we have a huge amount, close to 20% of teenagers that don't want to learn anymore after they are 16. So this logic of education or education system as selective is wrong. If the goal of education is the whole development of the child, the education system should personalize learning in a way that make each one of the child to develop um, their best potentialities and to orientate, to guide the kid in his or her professional, uh, sorry, uh, personal development and his uh, growth uh, in dignity, uh, in autonomy and in uh, meaning. There is now a question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to choose it now because it talks about uh, learners and, and, and how they participate in the change. It's a question from Cathy Runciman. How can learners, learners sorry, have more agency in deciding what the future of education should be rather than receiving a top-down model? Uh, this is a very complex issue. The question is very easy. <laughs> The issue is very complex uh, because at the end, the problem in education systems, and you could see this even clearer in the university, is that the actual goal has become the grades, the accreditation. So at the end, you are there and you are like, I don't care about this but I want the accreditation, the degree at the end. So I'm gonna stay here, but I'm not gonna make an effort to learn because what they want me is to pass particular, um, particular exams or particular uh, proofs to be able to uh, get this accreditation. Now, if we want to empower uh, learners, uh, we should do something that a good friend, Body Smith, always say, we have to transform the logic of teachers against learners. So teachers as the ones who know the answer and that hide the answer and say, now you learner, tell me the answer. And if it's right, I'm gonna give you the accreditation. So to break the logic of teachers against learners and to move of teachers and learners against ignorance, because when learning is relevant, all kids are motivated for learning. So if we want to empower and give agency to learners, we have to move system into a way that this learning becomes properly relevant and meaningful for learners. And this means to disempower a little bit teachers, to empower a little bit learners. If we want them when they are 16 or they are 18 to be properly autonomous, we should start by making autonomous progressively. Autonomy is something that you learn. And autonomy of learning, meaning learning to learn, is something that you must learn progressively. It's not something that happens by miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few questions. Uh, I'm sorry if I don't give the names of the people who asked them because I'm, I'm going to try to, I see that a lot of them go in the same direction, so I'm going to try to 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 mix them. So uh, what people are saying is, okay, uh, we want that change, but where do we start? Uh, inside school, outside school, there are people also who say uh, maybe we could we could start in at the at the university when teachers are learning and to, to teach them in, in, a, in a different way. And there is some, someone also who says, please, uh, could you give us like uh, tools, um, specific tools to do that? So they all go in uh, the same direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we did the, the um, diagnosis 
to design a Scola Nova Vintivo, this program, we realized that the main problem uh, for the transformation of the education system is that what it stops this transformation is multi-causal. So uh, there is a game that maybe you know, that uh, a game for kids that um, you have a hammer and then you have like a crocodile that goes out and you try to hit the crocodile and then another one hits it and then the other one, right? So it's a little bit the same. You try to hit teacher training and then the problem is teacher selection. You hit teacher selection, but the problem is assessment. You could sell uh, assessment, but the problem is curriculum. You hit curriculum, the problem is uh, timetables in the school. So when we real, what we realize is that we need to change the standard of quality. We need to redefine what quality education looks like to us. And that is why it's very relevant to have references of, what, of that standard of quality. And when I spoke about uh, cases like uh, High Tech High or Riverside, I was talking about these references. We already had references like this in most of our societies, but we thought that those were um, extravagances. Well, those are not extravagances. Now, let's move to the health system. When you want to train a surgeon, what do you do? You go to a university that is linked to a hospital where real surgeons are working with a particular standard and you don't discuss whether um, uh, the protocols for uh, cleanliness or how you start to cut something, uh, which kind of uh, how many people you have there. You don't discuss this because protocols are already established. So you have a standard of quality. Now with the schools, our main problem is that we don't have this standard. So you could try to start changing teacher training. But if you don't have the standard, you are going to perpetuate what people see in the schools that are trying to change but have not changed yet. So to me, the change need to be uh, addressing this multi-causality. And we need to transform the schools that we were thinking that were extravagant, I thanking them as reference. And in public, uh, public administrations should develop precisely systems of new assessment, competency-based curriculum, but they need to do it knowing that in the system we have the knowledge to develop that. And that means taking these reference schools and make them grow. We need more reference schools. So look at, at the problem here. If we think that schools um, are goods that we could um, that, that uh, we could reach for ourselves, so for our kids, then if the good school, if I could send my kids to the good school, I don't care that the other schools are bad. But if we, this is a wrong approach, because as I said before, education is a public, is a common good. So the bad education, if the kid of the poorest family is having a bad quality education, this is affecting me and the whole society. So what we need here is not reference schools to send the kids that are lucky. We need reference schools to be able to transform the whole system. We need more and more reference schools. We need a process of changing of the whole society. And we already have theories of change and procedures of change. This has been developed in many areas. Michael Fullan, for instance, in education is a great expert working on how to develop procedures of change. So you need to address this and to do long-term plans for transforming the education systems. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more questions concerning teachers. Uh, how can teachers, parents, schools 
can be encouraged to change their practice? Uh, how did you do that uh, with Ascola Nova Bintiu and Jordi, for example? He says, uh, the teachers of the future, I'm sorry because I'm translating, will they be more a guide for students than uh, people who transmit uh, specific knowledge? Well, um, imagine, Anna, that you and I are now sent to a high school in Barcelona. So mm -hmm. um, you are going to be the literature teacher. I learn a lot oh. about you. I, I learn a lot <laughs> from you, I'm sorry. And I could be the philosophy teacher. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, in our uh, faculty, we discuss, you're like, oh, Anna, you know a lot about literature, uh, you have been thinking a lot about uh, political and social philosophy with you, your specialty, but we need to address in artificial intelligence. So if our cell phone knows exactly where we are in every moment, and uh, when we um, upload the pictures that we take, our phone already is telling us who is the person of the picture that we just took. And little things called drones could go up and down without control. Is it imaginable a war where little drones could be sent and target particular, a uh, particular group of uh, citizens? Like imagine in the, in the Chile of Pinochet or the Argentina of Videla, where people were being taken in their houses. Now imagine that with the phones, the drones, and the facial uh, recognition. It could be much easier, right? So how could we have a debate on this in our class if you and I have no idea about all of this? Well. It's like the example that I said. You before. tell me. <laughs> it's not the teachers against the students. It's not the teachers that have the knowledge and the students that have, um, that acquire the knowledge of the teachers. It's the teachers that are helpers of the students to work together against the ignorance. Or in this case, against everything that we should learn together. And then, this anxiety that you were saying when you are like, look, people, I don't know what the graphene is. I have no idea about um, the ethical consequences of the um, uh, genomic transformation. Uh, I don't know what digital um, disruptive technology uh, could transform in our productive uh, system. Then it's like, well, you don't have to know everything. You have to be able to equip yourself and the students to go to the battle against ignorance and to go to the battle to solve these big, gigantic, complex uh, challenges that are not only challenges for the students, but challenges for us as adults as well. Mm -hmm. There were a few questions concerning the truth. You talked about that at the beginning of your speech. Um, let me find the questions. There was someone, Marcel, who said, do you think that it was easier to know what truth was before when there, there, was, uh, there wasn't so many noise or was it more difficult to get to the audience to create the same impact than a, than a newspaper? Uh, a lie? If it goes through 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 two channels, is it m more easy than a true subjective in twenty five channels? And then I think there is another question that is related a little bit to that too. It 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 asks about the information. Uh, it's Mikel. He says, "I believe education is key for meeting the SDGs, and critical thinking could play a very important role. We need to change consumption patterns and also and also the way." We inform ourselves. What's your view? Uh, I think that the concept of truth 
is very important on this education paradigm shift. Because let's go back to uh, hard times, Charles Dickens. No, the first idea is this entrepreneur saying, what you have to put in the head of kids is just facts. And it's a way to say, put only, they need to know what we already know. So we are the ones that send the truth. Now, what is the problem with this? At the beginning, you could say, well, if the teacher is the good guy, it's not the problem that the teachers give the truth. The problem is that if the teacher is the bad guy, then we have a problem, no? So if I believe in gender equality and uh, I have a teacher that says, look, men and women are not different, and uh, there is uh, uh, some research that explained this uh, different perception of gender when they are kids, and that's a social construction, but then you have data that explains that there is inequality on salaries, etc. I would say, oh, this teacher is good. Let's make this teacher to explain the truth. And then you have another teacher that says, oh, look, you know, I mean, in general, women is better that if they are at home and they take care of families, because otherwise what we have is a, is a society that um, is unbalanced because then everybody wants to go to, to work and no one is at home. And then I would say, oh, is, this is not the teacher that has the right truth, so I don't want him uh, to teach. If you go to politics, this is even worse. So what about history? What is the right, what is the truth in history? Uh, in all countries, you have a narrative of what is the hero and what is the villain, right? So we were successful in this battle. We were right in that moment and the other country was wrong. And the problem with the truth is that it also fits fundamentalism. Because if I am the one that decides that the teacher that says what I believe is right is the good teacher, and the teacher that says uh, what I think is wrong is the bad teacher, it means that if I am uh, changed by someone that believes that the good teacher should teach that the infidels go to hell and that the ones that behave in a particular way goes to heaven, then the logic of the truth is the same. Where all of this goes to the idea that we should move, we must move education systems from transmitting truths to inquiry-based learning. And this is why the role of teachers should change as well. Because we don't want teachers that transmit to kids what is the truth. We need teachers that equip kids with the capacity to inquire about themselves using methodologies that are profound in the internet, scientific methods, Socratic methods, to be able for them to think by themselves, to contrast information, to understand that what now it's considered right or it's considered scientifically proof, maybe in 10 years it's going to be um, false because a new discovery had been there. And that is linked to this idea of lifelong learning. It's the idea that we should acquire this capacity to learn permanently because we are permanently learning through this inquiry-based uh, approach. And this is fundamental in the era of internet, in the era of fundamentalism, and in the era of over-information. That is what leads to try to find around when the teacher is not there, who is the one that provides you information, the truth. And if the truth is a president saying, Mm. that when the votes that are making me president are enough, you should stop voting, accounting votes, because the, old, the other votes are fake. Then, if I've been raised believing the truth, 
I'm the one believing the truths. That's why inquiry-based learning is fundamental. I think that was a great example. <laughs> we really understood it. <laughs> uh, there are two specific questions. Uh, one from the very beginning, excuse me, Agusti. Uh, he asked about, he says that there is a movement uh, who wants to introduce intensive schedule in schools in Catalonia, and he doesn't seem to agree with that. And he's asking, are we going socially backwards with that? Uh, well, what Agustí is asking is something uh, very specific, which is the debate in Catalonia on whether um, schools should have um, the schedule uh, without a time for lunch. So you enter at eight and you leave at two or three, and then kids go and have lunch after all. Um, what is the problem with this particular debate? Uh, two different things. First, in, in Catalan society and in Spanish society, we have um, a big challenge with time. We are still having uh, very late dinners and then very late lunch. And then you have people that leave work at 7 p.m. and arrive home at 7.30 or 8, and then you don't have time for it. This is a, a problem that should be solved, socially speaking. Now, when you go to school, uh, you have, in this particular uh, case that he's asking about, two problems. The first is that um, this model doesn't allow kids to have time for having proper lunch until they leave school. So you have teenagers that have to wait for having lunch at 3 p.m. But the second problem that we have is that many families have no one at home at 3 p.m. So you could have the paradox of sending kids, particularly from underprivileged uh, communities, sending kids home where you have no family or nothing to do. So to do this, you have to, re to uh, address both the times, the schedules, of the professionals, of the, of, the, of the jobs, but also you have to provide proper extracurricular activities for kids. Because otherwise what you are doing in a context that I already explained, where we are living um, early school uh, living, you have uh, teenagers going out of school at three and having nothing to do and entering into a negative spiral of, um, of disengagement. Mm -hmm. This is my view on that. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, there is a question that I think is related to what you were just saying. And Mireya, she, she just asks about how can we... Mm. You can find the word in, in English, sorry, because the, the, the question was asked in Catalan. In Catalan. Uh, so, so what, what do we do with the uh, cultural uh, collisions, I would say, using, he said, uh, shocks that are happening now? Um, I would say that this is quite linked to this idea of truths, because mm -hmm. uh, our education systems have been designed to explain a particular truth, our reality. We do things in this particular way. We celebrate Christmas. Um, we have this kind of particular holiday. We eat this particular thing. And then suddenly, our societies, all societies in the world, uh, because precisely all the consequences of what globalization is, um, big migrations, easy communications, are more and more uh, multicultural. Now, the question here uh, could be, you, you could take two paths on that. One path, let's think, I'm, I'm improvising here. Let's think on, uh, on what I said before regarding curriculum. I said you could think on the whole development of the child and then disciplines and languages are ways for this whole development or you could think that school is mostly a 
a superposition of disciplines and languages. Maths plus history plus sciences plus English. This is the, the key, no? When you talk about uh, cultural diversity, you could make these two approaches as well. You could say, okay, I'm going to address cultural diversity by saying, instead of talking about Christmas, I'm going to talk about Christmas and about, um, 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 I don't know, um, uh, the Chinese New Year's or the, um, or the um, Ramadan. And this approach that could be right has one limit, which is that it's also talking about truths. It's making a reduction. Because not all kids in Catalonia like to celebrate Christmas. Not all kids in Catalonia do al cagatio. Not all kids in Catalonia um, like uh, the, uh, the maroons, the castañas. Hmm. So this is something nice, but it's a reduction. And then you could start creating the reduction of the other cultures. And imagine that this is diver cultural diversity. Well, to me, the most interesting thing in societies that are increasingly uh, diverse is to balance cultural diversity, meaning the understanding of the other and the recognition of the dignity of the other. That the way to live, the way to dress, the way to celebrate, the way to believe is, has the same dignity that yours. This is one thing. And at the same time, accept cultural descent, meaning the understanding that cultures are not pictures, but films, but movies. They are not something static, but dynamic. And this dynamic is something that should be done precisely by the people that compose those cultures. So that is why, although you now be, you see a picture because it's what you are seeing right now, if you imagine culture as something that evolves and that evolves because the interaction of uh, individuals and cultures, you could combine this understanding and, um, and comprehension of the other, the recognition of the, of the dignity of the other, and at the same time, the acceptance of cultural descent, of Catalans that believe that Caratio, the, 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 the celebration of the Tio, is something that they don't like. And that Muslims that believe that uh, covering the head or that a particular vision of women is not related with, uh, with Islam as a, as a belief. Um, of uh, Americans that think that the American dream is a myth, and uh, is not part of uh, what the identity of America should be. So this idea of cultural descent is fundamental for societies to evolve, because the antithesis of that is precisely the clash of, of beliefs, of truths. And I would say, and maybe you said that this was the last question, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. We really no, no, need no, no, to no. finish. I'm so yeah, sorry about so, that. No, 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 no. No, I, I wanted to take this and to go back to this idea of this uh, bright and achievable future. Uh, I know that all of this seems complicated. How to develop these societies where diversity is not a threat, but a richness? No? Um, how to achieve um, the answer of, uh, of uh, global warming? Or uh, how to um, work against, um, against hate, against uh, inequalities? And I do believe and that education is this gateway for this uh, bright and achievable future. And I believe so because I've seen it. And I think that most of the people that, is, um, that, is, uh, that have been with us during this hour uh, probably know experiences that are working in that direction. So the goal, the challenge here is how to make all these, uh, these um, examples, move them from exceptions to references for the whole system. And I believe that this is possible. Thank you so much, Eduard. I think this is something that people 
we'll be able to see also in the next sessions of Atlas of the Future, which will be happening weekly. So, so we will we will be there to to learn uh, more things and and to know how we can transform, which was the 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 word I first used. Thank you so much, really. Many thanks to you. <laughs> And thanks everybody who's been watching. It was a big pleasure. And Sylvia, I think we're done here. Thank you, Eduard. Thank you, Anna. It has been a lovely session, but as you know, uh, we run out of time and we have to leave it here. But uh, today, Eduard gave his uh, availability to stay a bit longer to answer to the question we could not uh, um, answer to during this uh, live using the chat box. So he will be chatting with you for a bit longer. Um, we see each other again here next week uh, where we will have the amazing opportunity to uh, welcome Kiran Bir Seti. So note it down uh, next Thursday, uh, 12th of November at 6. See you all here again and uh, let's keep fixing the future.